In this video, you'll learn about the three types of public services that keep our countries running and how you as a service design professional can design for them. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, I'm Sally. This is the Service Design Show, episode 169. Hi, my name is Mark Fontaine and welcome back to the Service Design Show. On this show, we explore what's beneath the surface of service design. What are those hidden and invisible things that make a difference between success and failure, all to help you design great services that have a positive impact on people, business and our planet. Our guest in this episode is Sally Halls. Sally is the head of the Policy Lab in the UK. Having years of experience working in the public sector, Sally is going to share a different side of service design with us today. But let me introduce this episode with a question. Think for a moment about all the public services you use in your country. What comes to mind? Getting your driving license, extending your travel documents, maybe voting registration or paying taxes? These are all public services provided by our governments. Now also think about the day-to-day -day services running in the background that keep our cities running smoothly, like keeping our roads safe, providing education and doing garbage collection, all services that our governments are tasked to do. Now imagine not having the right policies in place to secure our economy, protect our country or even allow you to travel freely. Well, this brings us to the topic of this episode, because you're going to learn about the three types of public services that need to be designed for and how the differences between these types of services impact you as a service design professional. So if you stick around till the end of this episode, you'll know how to design services that people haven't explicitly asked for, how service design professionals are bringing the voice of the public into rooms of policymaking, and how you can find fulfillment in your work when working on multi-year projects of which the impact isn't immediately clear. Well, that about wraps it up for the introduction. Now it's time to sit back, relax, and enjoy the conversation with Sally Halls. And welcome to the show, Sally. Hi, good to be here. Yeah, uh, excited to have you on. Um, interesting topic. I don't think we've covered it that many times. Uh, we'll uh, explain what the topic is in a second. But Sally, uh, the first thing I always start with uh, in these conversations is a short introduction to give some context to uh, who we are listening to. So could you share, uh, shine a light on uh, who you are and what you do these days? Yeah, sure. So I'm Sally Halls. Uh, I am a service designer. Currently, I'm in a role where I'm heading up the policy lab at a government department, and that enables us to bring service design methods into the policy making space. So we get a very different experience of service design and a very different experience of the kind of services that we work on. Mm, yeah, uh, quite a unique environment from what uh, I already learned from you in our prior conversations to this conversation. So uh, I'm looking forward to exploring that a bit more. Before we do that, we also have a lightning round. Uh, I have five questions for you uh, to get to know you a bit better as a person uh, next to the professional. Just the first thing that comes to your mind. Sure. Uh, and we'll, we won't dive deeper into them, but uh, let's see where this takes us. Are you ready? Yeah. All right. Sally, what's always in your fridge? Always in my fridge. Uh, butter and oat milk, I think. <laughs> All right. Uh, what's your favorite holiday destination? <laughs> oh, uh, any kind of a warm beach with a sea that I can swim in. Yeah, absolutely. Especially now that we're recording uh, this in the uh, middle of winter. Yes. Um, if you could recommend one book, which book would you recommend? I am reading at the moment, I'm reading Hello World, How to Be Human in the Age of the Machine. And that's by Hannah Fry. And it's really fascinating. It's all about data science and algorithms and actually how they're currently being used in our society and really helping me to think about how we can start to kind of bring some of those principles into our work. So uh, link in the show notes, as always. Um, Sally, what did you want to become when you were a kid? Oh, 
Uh, the first thing I remember wanting to be was a librarian, which is uh, not very exciting, but uh, I've always been a big reader, so uh, I guess it opens your horizons, right? Mm. Hmm. Uh, and uh, last and final question, which is a tradition here on the show, is uh, do you recall the first time you learned about service design? Yeah, I think it was when I was studying or when I was in my first job. So I actually studied industrial design and back then service design wasn't really a thing. It was just starting to be a thing. And you kind of heard it, heard, you know, heard it whispered about on the grapevine and I was very intrigued by it. And um and was very fortunate enough to actually be able to you know, become a service designer over the years. And, and here we are. <laughs> Everybody seems to have a story around their encounter with service design, which is, uh, which is quite interesting. Mm. Thank you for sharing uh, the answers to the lightning round questions. Um, definitely give some uh, context. Uh, but let's transition into the theme and topic of today. Um, like I said, it's something that surprisingly hasn't been covered a lot in the conversations on the show as far as I can remember. And that is, um, we're going to explore different types of services. Uh, somehow we don't get to discuss what services actually are on the show a lot. We do talk a lot about the craft and the tools, the methods, the conditions in which service design takes place or in which it can thrive. But we rarely actually talk about services. So this is going to be our opportunity to do so. And um, you uh, framed it really nicely by giving, um, a, I would say, a framework of three different types of services. Maybe we can start with that. and. Sure. What are the three services, types of services that you distinguish? Uh, so I think that normal normal services, the things that we kind of identify as services are what I would call transactional services. So there is a very clear ask from the user of, I am trying to achieve something and I will you know, perform some actions. I may pay you some money in order to achieve that outcome. And I think that's probably the bread and butter of service design work really. And I think services are quite difficult to talk about anyway, because they are so intangible, aren't they? Um, and so it becomes quite difficult, this conversation to have when you are trying to kind of pin down what a service is. But, you know, typically we're talking about, you know, I want to access healthcare, I want to see a doctor, or I want to be able to save my money with a bank, or, you know, I want to be able to purchase a book and have it arrive within 24 hours, right? Which is, uh, you know, that what we are all used to and expect these days. But um, once you start to move away from the private sector and those kind of services, and you start to think about public sector and what the government delivers, you start to encounter some slightly different services. So in the department I work in, uh, we deliver what we call, what I call preventative services. So these are the services that help us to, you know, live our day-to-day -day lives and, you know, maintain a kind of normal, state of society as you would expect so for example you know i am able to walk the streets safely i am able to you know go out and and feel confident that i can come home again you know and um and these are the kind of services that there is no explicit ask from the user there is just the expectation of what the norm is and actually it's when these services disappear when you don't deliver these services that then you start to notice that these services were being delivered for you. Um, and then the third kind of services I wanted to talk about was around, uh, from a service design perspective, they are an arm's length services. So there are services that you are commissioning. So actually, you know, government departments, they actually commission a lot of services. They don't deliver those services this, themselves. They ask other agencies, other bodies, other companies to deliver those services. But as a service designer, the tools that you suddenly have to design those services become very, very different. And so I thought it'd be interesting to talk a little bit around, you know, what do we do as a service designer? How do you ensure that your service is delivering a successful outcome when you're not able to do any of the service blueprinting? You're not able to talk to the users directly yourself. Yeah. Because that's the case, for instance, when those services are at arm's length and delivered and maybe uh, 
where the journey is designed by a third party uh, and you don't like you're commissioning them like yeah. you said right yeah, <clears throat> yeah so the, i can imagine that that's a different dynamic and the preventative services um uh, i do see a lot of them in the public sector I, mm -hmm. the thing in my head was garbage collection um yeah right yeah that's that's <laughs> one of those things uh that you sort of take for granted almost mm -hmm. maybe that's uh maybe yeah. that's the characteristics of these kind of services that you take them for granted and um once they disappear or break down or the garbage collectors go on strike then you sort of suddenly notice hey so i i was actually consuming a service um yeah and those are these preventative hidden uh services and the uh, the the common ones like you mentioned the tr transactional services are the ones that we are most exposed to as a service mm -hmm. design community right yeah absolutely and because there is a much clearer relationship with the end user you have a clarity around this is the user this is what they are asking for and I will work through these steps in order to deliver this for you. And I think as soon as it becomes a preventative services or the arm's length, that relationship breaks down and that, and so it becomes more difficult to talk about, I think. Um, I have some questions around that, but uh, mm -hmm. first I would love to explore that um, in our uh, prior conversation um, and in your notes, I saw that you mentioned something about that there is uh, some confusion and uh, maybe misconceptions around these preventative services. Yeah, so I think, you know, preventative services, they are often discussed in different ways. So within government, I would say they are not traditionally thought of as services. And we often talk about them as capabilities. And so, for example, do we have the capability to detect explosives at the airports, for example? And the way in which you talk about things really dictates the way you think about them and then the way that you you seek to kind of manage them and improve them. And obviously, you know, we're all very familiar with airports and having to queue to go through airport security. And actually, when you talk about, do we have the capability to, you know, detect explosives? Yes, we do. We have all these machines and, and they're able to scan and what have you. But when you frame it differently, when you start to put humans into that equation, you start to think in terms of, can we ensure that everyone can, you know, get on their plane and make it to their destination safely without encountering explosives? And, you know, can we do this in a quick and efficient way? And you start to think about, well, what is the human experience of that? How can we better improve that? And you start to think of it much more as a service. And then, and through that, you can then start to implement, you know, service metrics and start to look at customer experience, et cetera. Any idea or clue or hunch why uh, the language is more focused on capabilities and, and maybe uh, uh, having the right tools rather than providing a service? Like, is there a historic context that explains this? That's a good question. Um, I mean, often these are capabilities that are being delivered by operational teams. And so, you know, you have people who are, you know, performing the same task day in, day out, and they're not being seen as, um, you know, a skilled service that is being delivered. There is absolutely a whole skill set that, you know, these teams need to have in order to deliver those kind of actions and tasks but because it is being seen as an operation that a government is delivering i think it then you know government services have been going through a bit of a you know a revolution over the past however many years particularly in the uk and you know there's been a real transition between how we think about our interactions with the public and so you know gds government digital services they were kind of you know the people that really initiated the change and helped government to think differently about the services that we're delivering for our users. You know, all of our policies actually, they end up being delivered as services and that's how government interacts with the public. And I think it's just a continuation of that. So we started with the most visible services and, you know, it's a slow, it's a slow change. You're trying to move a, a very big ship and turn the ship around and, and the operational you know, operational staff and those 
kind of hidden services are at the back of the of mm. that big boat, I would say. Mm. Yeah, and uh, I've worked in the public sector in the Netherlands on some service design projects. And one of the things you often hear is like, um, it's a, a it's a monopoly on these services, and you can't choose like paying taxes, <clears throat> uh, right? There's yeah. there's just one entity you can go to, and uh, well, the same probably goes for your garbage collection. But yeah. uh, you also uh, uh, mentioned that uh, for these arm's length services, it's harder to talk to the user. I'm I'm curious, what are some of the uh, specific challenges that you see um, around these preventative and hidden services? Like what makes it more difficult or challenging for a service design professional to work on these preventative services? Let's focus on those first. Sure, so I think uh, with preventative services, you are I mean, often, you know, designing for the whole public and there is no specific user and so there are no specific needs. And so it becomes, because you're designing for everybody, you're almost designing for nobody, if that makes sense. Um, and it became, And so it also then becomes challenging to have those conversations with you know the service providers with the people who's you know buy-in that you need and whose opinions you need to change to help them kind of understand well we're trying to help people for example i don't know with the border force you know you're, you're saying well actually we're trying to prevent dangerous materials from coming into the country so that the entire population can live in a kind of peaceful, secure, safe country, right? And so it's a it's a very high level objective, and that can make it quite hard to then tie the activities that staff are doing, the day to day activities, with kind of tangible, measurable outcomes. And so, you know, that might be the vision, I guess. And then you need to start to break it down into much smaller kind of objectives and targets where you can then start to tie activities to those outcomes that makes sense yeah it makes absolute sense and uh like the 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 feedback loop is um w less strict or less connected or i don't know what mm. the right word is but you sort of uh like uh being uh at the security uh and doing border control like it's really hard to feel that you're contributing to uh sense of yeah. safety inside the country like that's that's a pretty um yeah pretty loose feedback loop right yeah absolutely and you know are they getting any feedback right actually is that feedback coming in and there are so many other factors as well it's such a kind of complex problem right and so how can you tie this action that you are performing over here to this kind of bigger initiative what does this mean for you as a service design professional? How do you how do you handle these situations? I mean, it's difficult, right? It's it's always a lot of what we do as service designers is often kind of advocating for a, a different way of thinking, a kind of a, a mindset that kind of you know puts the customer first and helps you know realign the services and how they are being delivered around kind of delivering to those user needs and it and it is the same as that it's just an extension right so you know we are still trying to achieve an outcome for a user it's just a little bit more removed but you can still go through some of those same service design activities and you can really help to kind of I don't know, even just bringing the conversation into the room sometimes just achieves a bit of a different mindset because until that point, you might find that a lot of the people in the room hadn't even thought about it in that way. You know, they've been they've been looking at productivity outputs, right? Like how many decisions are you making a week? Or, you know, how many discoveries are you making a week? Or, you know, X, Y, Z, right? And And that's a very different metric to how safe do our citizens feel, right? And so I think just helping to bring in that bigger picture and helping to kind of elevate the kind of the horizon that people are looking at is probably a really useful role that we play as service designers. <clears throat> Related to this, I'm, um, mm. I'm curious, like, uh, 
Let's say uh, you a new colleague starts in your team tomorrow and uh, yeah. they are coming from an agency or consultancy side having uh, primarily been exposed to these uh, transactional services, these co the commercial sector. Like what would be some of the things that you uh, have them do first or maybe uh, some lessons that you first would share with them in their onboarding process to uh yeah to get them up to speed yeah um i mean it's a challenge that we uh, are constantly uh <laughs> encountering as we onboard more staff so um i mean the first thing we ask them to do is to kind of go through some of the policy making training to understand actually what do our policy colleagues experience um because that immediately gives you a different sense of what the job is right these are the people that we are working alongside and these are the things that they are being asked to deliver and our role is then to support them um we also uh you know we have to brief them in all the different kind of policy areas that we work in and each of those areas comes with a very different mindset very different culture and uh and that brings with it a different way of working a different way of engaging with the stakeholders and then um once they become familiar with the policy areas, then you can start to talk about, well, actually, what are the ways in which we're working? How are the ways in which we're able to make an impact? And I mean, we don't have all the answers. We're still learning, you know, and every day we encounter new problems and new challenges that, you know, we have to feel our way into. But, you know, it's always interesting. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> this... Um... There was one question on my mind that uh, also comes from my experience with working with the with public services is that mm. <clears throat> have you found a way to sort of uh, celebrate success? And what I mean with that is, again, like you said, you mostly notice these services when they start lacking or they start malfunctioning. Um, so yeah, if you're redesigning the garbage collection service, uh, I found that it can be really hard to sort of, uh, find pride and find joy and find a sense of fulfillment mm -hmm. and that you're doing a good job because like you, you can almost only fail. Like what's your, what's your take on that? Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, I think it's fair to say, you know, it's, the work can be quite challenging and um, it can take a while for the impact of your work to kind of manifest. So, you know, some, you know, explorative work we can do, you know, it might take for some policy colleagues, it might take a year, two years for that actually to kind of manifest in a policy outcome. And then it takes, you know, uh, a further amount of time for them that to kind of actually be experienced as services by members of the public but you have to take success as you know changing an opinion as you know influencing a decision towards what will achieve a better outcome and those are the things that kind of it's the ripple effect right actually if you have someone at the top making the right decision then the impact of that will then impact you know hundreds thousands millions of people depending on you know what that service is so yeah i so it's way harder for you to actually evaluate if services are improving because it just can take a very long time be before they ripple out into and uh, before the general public starts to see the effect and like who will say that the garbage collection has actually become better like that that <laughs> yeah. it's it's just one but where your your measure of success is are we seeing decisions being made that are more in line with uh, uh i don't know how in more in line with how would you describe that i would say are, are the decisions actually do we think the decisions are actually going to have a better outcome for the service users for the members of the public and you know a lot of our work is about evidencing the decisions that need to be taken and helping senior people to understand this is what the public are experiencing at the moment and actually if we take these steps that will improve it in this way and often 
that can be counter to, you know, what is currently being considered. And so if we can change that opinion, then we have gathered the right evidence and we have created a compelling case to ensure that the right outcomes are going to be met. And when you mention evidencing, what can you can you color that a bit? Like, how do you do that? What is that? Sure. I mean, a lot of it is around kind of understanding what uh, users, members of the public are experiencing at the moment. So, you know, through deep dive interviews, we will often then, you know, kind of, we'll, we'll still do the journey mapping, kind of understanding the experience, the end to end experience uh, of those people. And typically you'll find that you know, the service that they're experiencing is being delivered by multiple, you know, agencies and teams and companies and what have you. And so often we are there to kind of help join all of those silos together and to kind of really help those teams to understand the problem in the whole and the different levers that are available. And, you know, policymakers will typically see opportunities in terms of policy opportunities but they may not necessarily be so connected with how it's being operationalized or how you know the kind of digital and technology solutions and actually those are all levers that can help kind of build momentum and build kind of change towards the policy outcomes that they are looking to deliver mm. so <clears throat> uh in my in the way I, I, I would summarize is, is one is you're bringing in the voice of the public inside the orga in an yeah. organization even more than it is maybe already there. Um, and the other thing is you're uh, looking at what you're delivering from a more holistic uh, cross department silo mm -hmm. breaking perspective. That That's at least the two things that I'm getting from your story. Yeah, I think that's probably right. Yeah, and then <laughs> thank you for interpreting. <laughs> yeah, you can use this uh, recording to to share through the organization. <laughs> but yeah, that makes um, that makes a lot of sense. And and doing sense making, and then um, maybe being less involved in actually designing the actual services, but providing uh, your colleagues with the right tools, with the right insights uh, to make yeah. uh, the right or slash better decisions. That sounds like a great summary. Thank you. <laughs> I'll use that. <laughs> We've talked uh, now about these preventative services, um, but you also mentioned services that are at an arm's length. I would love to dive into that also uh, a bit. And I think you gave uh, an example at the start, but maybe you can um, uh, help me to better, even better understand, like what are these services that are an arm's length? Uh, good question. So, I mean, typically, as I said, a government department will commission a number of different services. It's not possible for us to deliver all of those services and they can be, you know, varying scales. So, you know, the police forces, you know, very large service, right? Um, and, you know, at, at a smaller end, you know, you've got kind of various support services that might be being delivered for kind of very kind of much smaller populations. And actually, it's it's quite a challenge and it's quite a different way of thinking when you start to think about well we are commissioning this service and how do we ensure that they are achieving success so um if i let's let's take an example right if i was to ask you to ask let's say we've had some news in that you know children aren't working to school anymore and you know we're kind of seeing all sorts of kind of obesity problems with them and actually how can we encourage children to start walking to school right so we think okay well we need to how can we help them we'll, we'll commission some kind of you know help walk your children to school service right and so how do i what if I look to commission that service, how do I know what success looks like? Am I just saying, well, I just need you to get the children to school safely, you know? And then you start to dig down a level and you say, well, actually, I need you to get the children to school safely and they need to be there on time. They need to be, you know, they need to be escorted by people with the suitable kind of background checks and qualifications. And actually, well, how many children can you take? And actually, 
what are all the kind of frameworks that I need to put in place in order to ensure that you can do your job correctly and safely? And, you know, what am I asking you to do? What am I contracting you to do? That makes sense. And, you know, what, what are the outcomes that I'm measuring, right? And actually the way in which, you know, it's, you're still talking about kind of service design principles. You're still, you know, looking to kind of quantify the outcomes and measure what is this kind of satisfaction and what have you, but you have to do it at a, a stage removed. So I need to put things like that in the contract. I need to think about actually how am I governing your service, right? What are the meetings that we have? When do I touch base with you? How are you reporting back to me on how well the service is going? You know, and how can I be sure that that what you say is actually true, right? And and so you start to think about all of these other tools, I guess, that you have that you need to think about to ensure that this service over here is operating correctly and that and that we can achieve the outcomes. And you know, there is an extra level of responsibility, I guess, because it's a government department, and you need to ensure you know everyone's safety and well-being. But Yes, I think so. Well, uh, my brain always goes into uh, examples that I've seen. And you mentioned the uh, walking mm. your kids to school example. Uh, recently, I was in a local hardware store and there yeah, they provide a service of uh, putting uh, solar panels on your roof. But that is uh, mm. it's not a service from the hardware store itself. Uh, it's done by a third party supplier, like under the label of the hardware store. And I'm thinking mm. like this might be something similar where uh, you sort of purchase the the service through the hardware store, but it's actually delivered by a third party. Um, and um, when we look at that example, you like what is there to design? You mentioned the the, the contracts, like the conditions, but. Um, let me just rephrase the question again. Like, uh, is there something to design? And is that, do you feel the work of a service designer still? Yes, because the way you design the contract, the way you word the contract very much impacts how the service will be delivered. So if you can input into that process, you can help to ensure that the service is being set up in the right way. It's being managed in the right way, you know, and the funding agreements and how you look to fund the service can also impact, you know, how well that service can operate, etc. Uh, we often talk about this, but the, in this case, it's even more you're designing for the conditions in which the service can be, wh where you're increasing the chance of success for the service. Yes, exactly. You're kind of, trying to create an environment to enable the service to flourish and you're trying to create an environment that will nurture that service right how do you kind of set the right guidelines for that service to kind of travel down which will ensure that it won't diverge and kind of you know go off on some kind of random track and actually not achieve the outcomes that you're looking for it's interesting because we do hear this uh, a lot and it's not even with arms length services, but it's um, it's also like designing the internal organization in order to deliver a specific service. Like it seems that as service design professionals, we are doing a lot around designing the environment that enables a certain type of service experience to emerge. And in this case, yeah the service might not be provided by people who are under the same roof as you, but have a different uh, logo and sticker and name on their uh, organization. But in, uh, in essence, yeah, you're still creating or designing the environment. Yeah, I think that's a really good way of thinking about it. And once you've created that environment, you know, then I think, you know, organization design is becoming a big thing. I think, you know, we're seeing increasing amounts of, you know, kind of projects where we are being required to think about how the organization is being set up, how it's being resourced, and, you know, what is the role and remit and actually what are the responsibilities of the people within that. And all of that, you know, they're all just new or different levers to ensure that you reach the outcome of, you know, what your service is trying to achieve.
What would you say is the most difficult part of designing services that you uh, describe as being at arm's length? I mean, you can feel quite twitchy about wanting to get stuck into the actual service, you know, like it's, you do have to kind of, it's not your role to get involved in the detail of that service. Your role is actually around understanding the parameters to enable that service to succeed and to ensure that those are being designed and, in, and created correctly. And often that means working with staff who are very, uh, you know, colleagues who are very uh, far removed from, you know, your typical design colleagues. They don't talk in design terminology. They don't necessarily understand your design vocabulary. And so, you know, there's a lot of relationship building kind of communication trying to understand you know when i say this word and you say this word do we mean the same thing are we aligned or are we using the same word totally you know cross purposes and um i mean it's it's amazing we we are constantly aware of the need to do this and yet we are constantly finding that it's it's a challenge, isn't it? You know, we are always uh, talking at slightly cross purposes when we are really trying mm. to achieve the same yeah. things. Yeah, I don't know if that's a specific challenge to the service design field, but uh, uh, it, it is yeah. uh, definitely a common theme in uh, in our practice. What, um, what would you say uh, are um, the common mistakes that you see people making when uh, you what i found interesting uh, uh let me go back for a second what i found interesting is that you said uh it's uh, it's itching to get into the actual weeds of the actual service and that's not your role so the way i i described it in my head is like you have a different design material you're not designing the service anymore but you are designing the organization or you're designing contracts governance mm -hmm. uh calendars meetings stuff like that um and working with that other design material that that has to have a certain interest and you have to also get pleasure mm -hmm. out of that um yeah what are some of the common uh, mistakes or pitfalls that you see uh, maybe people getting into this kind of work making when they are not being able to design the actual service, but rather have to work with the other design material, the organization? I mean, I think a lot of it is often counterintuitive to, to be working at that level, I would say. You know, as a service designer, you do expect to be kind of working in the nuts and bolts of how that service operates so it feels a bit counterintuitive and, and it therefore feels a bit uncomfortable and actually that can cause us to kind of perhaps lean back a bit to kind of be a bit like oh i need to do this thing but i'm not i, I don't feel comfortable i don't feel confident and you know as with all of these things as with all the challenges that causes more issues. You've got to embrace these things. You've got to lean in and get involved and really start to kind of understand these new tools that we have. And, you know, key to that is always asking questions. And I feel like there is a lot of, um, you know, we can be, especially if we don't feel confident, we can be very cautious about asking questions and not appearing to, to look stupid and everything else. And actually, you know, no question is ever too stupid, right? And the stupid one is the one that you don't ask. And, you know, and if, you're, if you feel nervous about asking that question, think about how you can reframe it, right? Ask the question, but ask it in a way that, you know, that kind of draws out the information, but doesn't, you know, doesn't make you feel exposed and, you know, helps to kind of shed light on the situation where you can really feel able to practice and to add value and to you know really bring those skill sets that you have to a kind of very different problem area now uh if you're open to sharing i'm curious what was the last moment that you felt uncomfortable <laughs> uh yeah that's a very good question um 
I mean, we are currently uh, scoping out a new project and it's a new policy area. And every time we work in a new policy area, you know, you're working with colleagues who are so knowledgeable about this area. And it, your job is to get up to speed and to read all the reports in the t past 10 years and understand all the different, uh, you know, initiatives that are happening. And all of these conversations, you're always trying to understand the scoping and the background and the context. And it's always a little bit uncomfortable, if I'm honest. It's always, you know, you're always operating in the unknown. And that's what we do as designers. You know, we are we are there to kind of operate in these kind of tricky, unknown kind of problem spaces. But I think I've learned to lean into the discomfort. I think that was my New Year's resolution for this year was to actually kind of lean into all those moments that I find uncomfortable and to really embrace that discomfort. And, you know, and that actually, part of that helps us to work better, to perform better. You know, that slight adrenaline does help mm -hmm. us mm -hmm. keep going. Yeah, right? that is the fun <laughs> and exciting part of our work, like uh, being in the unknown, in the unknown, exploring the unknown and being comfortable with the unknown. But mm -hmm. it's definitely easier said than done, especially mm -hmm. when it comes to uh, yeah. uh, yourself. Like it's easy to tell this to somebody else, to your client, that they need to have patience and trust the process and that everything will be all right. But uh, yeah, when uh, you have to uh, share this message with yourself, then it's often a different story. And uh, yeah, uh, yeah, imposter syndrome is, is very, very uh, near as always. What, do, mm -hmm. yeah, um, if we, um, if we would have had this uh, conversation five years ago, uh, no, let me let me rephrase this again. Like if you um, were listening to the service design show five years ago and somebody uh, was on the show uh, having a conversation with me about uh, these types of services, what do you wish you would have heard in that conversation? Like uh, what do you wish you would have known, I don't know, five years ago that you know now from experience? I always found, you know, I always... I'd heard about policy labs and I was so excited about the idea of bringing kind of our design methods and ways of working into that kind of what felt like a very more serious kind of problem space as it were and actually I think I was quite intimidated by it I think it took me a while to kind of reach a point where I felt experienced enough and confident enough to even apply right and actually you know, the only way to gain the experience is to apply and to get involved and to start working in that area. And, you know, if you're even in, vaguely interested, then, you know, absolutely get in touch with your local, you know, policy lab or initiative that you can find and, and reach out and just show that you're interested. And, you know, it's an incredibly exciting area to be working. And it is always... You know, every day is really interesting. There is never a dull moment. So, yeah, yeah. So don't wait till you have the experience, gain, start and and gain the experience uh, mm -hmm. while you do the work. Um, are there any useful resources, links that uh, you can recommend for people who want to dive deeper into this topic? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So there is, um, in the UK, we have a policy design community where, you know, people working in this area uh, come together and there's, so there's a kind of very active blog. So I can um, share the links for that. Uh, we also have things like the kind of open policy making kit, which is also a website which kind of helps uh, policy makers to work in a much more open and kind of explorative way, which is quite useful for designers as well to understand, well, here, here are the ways in which we're trying to educate our policymakers. So it kind of gives you a, the, the, the kind of the different way in. Um, and then, I don't know, in terms of kind of government services, for those uh, who aren't aware, there's um, Lou's Down, Lou Down's book on good services. It's just a general kind of go-to Bible and often kind of gives very good examples of kind of government services. So maybe that's a kind of entry level into kind of public sector work. We've discussed a lot. Um, if you uh, uh, could take an attempt to sort of summarize our conversation uh, up to this point, like what would your summary be? Uh, I mean, 
I think the summary would be that there are many types of services out there which require us to kind of have different relationships with the users and engage with different tools perhaps but actually the kind of the intention behind how a service designer works always is always the same right and it's just we need to be flexible and adaptive to kind of work in these new areas and really help others to kind of embrace the service design you know ethos mm. and uh, mm. mindsets yeah and uh, thank you for sort of highlighting uh, and, and double clicking on the word service because I think we need to do that more often and even develop a better understanding of the mm. different flavors of services and the different characteristics of the di different services uh, and there's so much more to uh, learn and explore and there's already a lot of knowledge around that so uh, I hope this uh, mm. got a few people interested to dive deeper into these uh, topics and learn more about preventative services, arm's length services, and, and maybe come up with their own definitions and uh, ideas on what kind of services yeah. are there out there and what does that mean for us as a service design community. So yeah, thank you, uh, Sally, for coming on and uh, shining uh, a light on that. I found it really eye-opening to learn about these three types of services and how they impact our work as service design professionals. Hopefully this got you thinking as well. If you enjoyed this episode, consider subscribing to the channel so that you'll be notified when new episodes come out. My name is Mark Fontijn and I want to thank you for tuning in to the Service Design Show and I look forward to see you in the next video.